Welcome to this Vote 2010 New Mexico Special Congressional Town Hall Debate, brought to you by New Mexico's public media stations and New Mexico First. Tonight, it's the first congressional district debate between Republican John Barella and Democrat Martin Heinrich. Now, here's your host, veteran ABC News journalist, Sam Donaldson. Welcome to the second of our three congressional town hall debates, where everyday New Mexicans have the unique opportunity to meet the candidates one-on-one -on -one and ask questions about the important issues. We're coming to you live from the studios of KNME, a co-licensee of the University of New Mexico and the Albuquerque Public Schools. We're also on the airwaves statewide thanks to our partners at KENW in Portales and KRWG in Las Cruces. And we also welcome all of you tuning in around the state on one of our other public media radio stations. Tonight we feature the candidates of New Mexico's first congressional district. Please join me in welcoming Democrat incumbent Martin Heinrich and Republican challenger John Barella. <laughs> Tonight's event, tonight's event is co-sponsored by the public policy organization New Mexico First. Before we get into this important dialogue, let's hear from New Mexico First's president, Heather Ballas, on the process used in developing tonight's questions. Heather? Thanks, Sam. Tonight's town hall debate focuses on issues that people like you believe are important. The community members in this studio spent most of today in a town hall meeting agreeing on the most critical issues facing New Mexico's first congressional district. Our town hall participants, who include a mix of Democrats, Republicans, and independents, certainly don't agree on everything, but they're united in their commitment to treating one another with civility and respect. They worked hard to develop an interesting policy-focused set of questions for Martin Heinrich and John Barella. The citizens behind the microphone tonight are not necessarily posing their own questions. They're representing the entire group, focusing on the issues the town hall believes are most important. There isn't time in this program to address all the people's questions, so the full list will be posted tomorrow at NewMexicoFirst.org. We hope the candidates find ways to address those issues before Election Day. Now, Sam, back to you and tonight's town hall debate. Thank you, Heather. The ground rules for tonight's event are quite simple. Gentlemen, as you know, the voters of this district got together this afternoon and came up with the questions. The wording is theirs. We want a spirited debate, so there's no time limit, such as one minute, 30 seconds. Uh, if you go too long on a question, I'll probably move you along to the next question so that we can get in as many as possible. But it's your debate. Now, by a coin toss, the first question will go first to Martin Heinrich, and then after that, we'll alternate. Our first questioner, if you'll just please come up to the microphone, is Mary Ellen Roderick, an architect and laid off one week ago, I understand. Yes. Well, all right. Have at them. Thank you, Sam. Um, thank you guys for being here. Um, yes, I was part of the jobs, economy, unemployment session, the roundtable. Uh, what in the way of policy and legislation would you support to provide jobs? Be specific, please. Mr. Heinrich. Thank you for the question, and there is no more important issue right now, I think, for, uh, for New Mexico and for the nation than how we continue uh, our economic recovery. Uh, when I was elected to office, we were losing about 800, almost 800,000 jobs every single month. Uh, and while we've arrested that and now seen nine months of uh, positive private sector job growth, when you hear the story of the people who want to work, and who yet cannot find a job, our job uh, in Washington, D.C. is far from done. Uh, I believe one of the most important things we can do uh, to address the jobs issue and to make sure that we, uh, that we grow our jobs is uh, to implement the small business lending legislation that we just passed through the House and Senate. Uh, just passed, or signed by the President uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the same day he was here in New Mexico. Uh, when I sit down with small businesses all over my district, I hear from people who want to expand and can't, uh, can't get the lending from a bank. And um, there is no bigger lever to bring on more people and more jobs than small businesses. If our small businesses had access to credit, um, I think we would have a, a, a much more robust uh, jobs market right now. You know, within the first first week of that legislation, 2,000 
Uh, 2,000 loans were made over a billion dollars to small businesses. That was only the SBA, Small Business Administration portion. There's the direct lending portion that has the potential to put $300 billion worth of loans into the hands of small businesses so that they can hire again. Mr. Perella. Thank you. First, I want to thank you, Mr. Donaldson, and thank New Mexico First and KNME and all of you for being here. It's a great honor to be here and to be discussing these issues. Thank you, Mr. Heinrich, also for appearing. This issue is about jobs. This election is about jobs. That's the issue of this campaign. I have talked to many, many people in this district, and those who are about ready to lose their jobs, about ready to lose their business, uh, about ready to lose faith in the economy, uh, many of which have already done that. We know the statistics, and the scorecard is not good with this Congress. We have lost through over three trillion uh, dollars worth of, mo uh, of money to debt and deficit. Uh, that is money that is being taken out of the private sector. That does not create jobs. We've lost three million jobs in the private sector over the last two years. We continue to propose new so-called stimulus, but it hasn't created jobs and it's totally been uh, a failure. And we need to understand that more spending, more debt, more regulations is not the way to grow the economy. Let me also state the proposition that I have a a very, very different philosophy from Mr. Heinrich's approach. He has voted for what I consider to be jobs-killing legislation, whether it was the health care bill, which poses new and burdensome tax regulations and uh, regulations on businesses and individuals, whether or not it was the uh, cap-and-trade bill, a scheme that basically creates energy taxes for small businesses and individuals, increases taxes on the energy uh, front from uh, anywhere from twelve to sixteen hundred dollars per family. Look, as a small business guy, a guy who has created jobs, let me tell you what we need to do. First of all, we need to create a budget, pass a budget in D.C., so that we don't plunge this economy into further debt and deficit. Unfortunately, Mr. Heinrich recessed, uh, along with his Democrat colleagues, and did not pass a budget, the most basic, basic legislative function of, of any kind of legislative body. Secondly, we, not, we do not need to impose new taxes upon individuals or small businesses. That's the wrong approach. It's the wrong thing to do at this time. Even 40 of Mr. Heinrich's Democratic colleagues uh, support an extension of, of the tax uh, breaks uh, for at least two years. Uh, we certainly cannot impose a, a new regulations. Uh, new burdensome regulations on small businesses, as has been done for the last two years in Washington. That's the wrong approach. And we need to focus exclusively on and laser focus as members of Congress and as a society on creating private sector jobs. The basic philosophy that I have is it's the private sector, the risk takers, the entrepreneurs that are going to lead us out of the recession. It's not government. And that's the uh, program that this, this Congress has been passing. Gentlemen, we have a number of questions coming up later on taxes, so let's not exhaust that subject here. But, Congressman, if you want to answer sure. what your opponent well, said. I, you know, I've been trying to figure out for a year and a half, because we've, we've been in this uh, race for a while, uh, what John does for a living. And I think there's a difference between being a small business person and being a wealthy investor in a string of failed businesses. And when I talk to small businesses, they get up each and every morning they put in 60-hour weeks, and they're trying to get access to credit so that they can grow jobs. Uh, it didn't add a penny to the deficit to step up and make that happen. In fact, the way we paid for it is we, we closed a tax loophole that actually encouraged American corporations to ship their jobs overseas and gave them a tax benefit to do that. We closed that, and as a result, we kept over 1,000 teachers in the classroom here in New Mexico. And at the same time, uh, we were able to pay for legislation uh, that puts lending into the hands of small businesses. Uh, it, it's absolute, there is no bigger issue than allowing small businesses to grow. Mr. Barrella, are you small, Mr. you're large? I mean, <laughs> Mr. Heinrich, uh, we have not created a string of failed businesses. As a matter of fact, you know that we have a group, a small uh, high tech company here in New Mexico that has seven well-paying jobs. Uh, they pay well over 80000 an average salary. We pay health care for these individuals. Uh, you have some successes sometimes, you have some failures, but you learn from it. Your experience in the private sector is painfully short, Mr. Heinrich, and you know that. Uh, you come from the government sector. You have been a product of government, and your philosophy is that government creates jobs. 
It's the risk takers, the entrepreneurs, the taxpayers that expend, expand that tax base, which provide for your salary and the salaries of others. So, uh, you know, as far as being lectured about uh, how to create jobs, Mr. Heinrich, I don't think you've created any. Okay. Gentlemen? You know, it's funny that the small business uh, that uh, the high-tech business that my opponent just mentioned, Sarah Link, uh, it's, a, it's a business that relies actually on a taxpayer-funded supercomputer uh, to do their work for them, to render movies here in New Mexico. Uh, they couldn't do that work if they had to do it on their laptop at home. They utilize our taxpayer resources to be able to do that work. Uh, in addition, they wouldn't be competitive if they didn't have a 25% tax credit from the state of New Mexico to do film work here as opposed to somewhere else. I don't have a problem with those policies. I think we should have public-private partnerships and business and government should work together to grow our, our, uh, our economy. But I don't think we can wag our finger with, you know, on one side and have our hand out on the other. Mr. Borello, you have the last word and we yeah. move on to another question on this subject of jobs. Thank you for conceding that we do have a successful small business and we have never taken a dime of any direct tax credit from the state of New Mexico or anyone else. But while we're on this subject, I want to thank you, Mr. Heinrich, because uh, I appreciate your endorsement of my abilities. Uh, in May of 2009, a month before I decided to run for Congress, you sent me a letter asking me to be on your business advisory council on the economy, asking me to advise you. So I'm greatly flattered by that invitation. Thank you for doing that. Obviously, I didn't accept the invitation. I decided to run for Congress because I think that's where my talent and expertise is, is best used. And in that letter, I appreciate your flattery, uh, Mr. Heinrich, and uh, telling me that, uh, that I had an expertise in the economy, uh, new small business. And uh, so I appreciate that very, very much. Mr. Heinrich, if you want to come back to this later, you certainly may, but let's move on. I'm going to take this out of turn because this job issue is really important, as both of you have conceded. Uh, Tim Walker, where are you, Tim? Uh, a 30-year military veteran has a question on uh, a hot one about jobs and what causes them or not. Sir, uh, did the stimulus work? And how do you know that? Uh, Mr. Brella, you start. Stimulus was a massive failure. We have a national debt of $13.3 trillion. That's $44,000 per man, woman, and child. Other countries around the world have tried to stimulate their economy with more government spending. It simply doesn't work. The sad fact of the matter is, is that we are levying upon future generations of children a $44,000 debt. Now to personalize this, I have a son who's a senior in college, and his dream is to open up a business. Now that's going to be at least $44,000 taken out of his private accounts, a private opportunity to invest in his dreams, whether it was opening up a small business of his own, whether it was saving for his own children's college education, or even buying a house. That's $44,000 taken out of his pockets. And that's what we're doing to him and to your children and to your grandchildren. It's the wrong way to grow an economy. Martin Heinrich. Well, well I think first off, it's, it's important to realize why we needed a recovery act. Uh, we needed a Recovery Act because at the end of the last administration, uh, their incredible lack of oversight and, and support of basically a casino mentality on Wall Street, um, the, the trading of mortgages like they were just another co commodity, uh, created an enormous economic recession, uh, the biggest downturn that we have experienced since the Great Depression. Uh, we had no choice but to act. And there are many who said uh, we should have done nothing. Uh, most economists say we would have seen 16 million jobs lost had we done nothing. Uh, we would have seen double-digit unemployment, not, uh, not like it's 8.8% in New Mexico right now, 9.6% across the country, 16% is what we would have seen. I don't think any of us ran for Congress wanting to do a Recovery Act. We had ideas about growing jobs with clean energy legislation, about solving our health care woes and others. But I can tell you that the people that I've met who have jobs because of the Recovery Act, I was on the west side of a new housing development. A guy named Julian Gomez was out of work until he got hired back because of the lending that was available because of the Recovery Act. $30 million worth of construction going on at Kirtland Air Force Base because of the Recovery Act. Work at I-40 in Paseo and all across New Mexico where construction workers are the, the most hard hit 
people in this recession were back at work because of the Recovery Act. We need to get our fiscal house in order. That is true and that's something that both John and I agree on. We disagree on how to get there. If the tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires, for people like Donald Trump, would have been the economic success story that he suggests they are, we'd be out of the recession right now. We've had those in place for years. They're going to blow a $700 billion hole in our budget deficit over the next 10 years. I support extending the tax cuts for middle class, hardworking New Mexicans, not people like Donald Trump. Before you reply, and I know you have something to say, I want Tina Carson to come up here because this group has worked on taxes and tax questions all afternoon. May I answer the question? Uh, well, <laughs> and, and Tina's going to pose the question that you've already started to answer, but I'd like you to do it. Well, after the chapter co as we're in the 11th hour here, gentlemen, and thank you, Mr. Donaldson, mm -hmm. will you or would you extend the Bush tax cuts? And if so, for which groups? Well, uh, Martin Heinrich, you're the first up. Mm -hmm. Do you think you've already answered, or would you like to take another crack at it? Well, to make it crystal clear, I think we should extend those tax cuts uh, due to the recession for middle class working families, uh, people making less than a quarter million dollars adjusted gross income. But for millionaires and billionaires, we simply can't afford to. Uh, it was the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts. Uh, along with two wars that were deficit financed, along with a new uh, Medicare Part D drug program, that's a great program, but was completely unpaid for by the Bush administration, deficit financed, that got us into the year-over-year -year deficit that we face now. Not the one-time uh, issue of the Recovery Act, but the year-over-year -year inability to have as much income coming in as what we're spending out. We can't afford to blow another $700 billion hole in our budget deficit over the next 10 years by extending the Bush tax cuts for people like Donald Trump. John Barilla. Well, let me quickly address the, both questions. The stimulus, first of all. Um, the stimulus bill, like much of the legislation that Mr. Heinrich and Ms. Pelosi have proposed, are a trail of promises made and promises broken. Mr. Heinrich, you can remember that there were promises made that if you pass that $800 billion stimulus bill, which now with interest will cost $1.2 trillion, a promise made, a promise broken. But you promised, and the administration promised, and this Congress promised that if we passed it, unemployment would not be above 7.9 percent. And yet here we are. 9.6% unemployment rate, 17.1% underemployment rate. Now I'm going to ask everybody in this audience, and I would ask the viewers to say, is that a successful thing? You say things could have been worse, but you promised things would be better if you passed this. It's just that simple. The, the stimulus bill was a colossal failure. And oh, by the way, another $50 billion that's being proposed by the administration, and I think supported by Mr. Heinrich, for shovel-ready projects when the president already said, well, there may not have been such a thing as shovel-ready projects. And that's a tacit, in my opinion, a tacit admission that the first so-called stimulus, failed stimulus, was a failure. So, so the fa I think the, the jury's pretty clear on that, that the stimulus failed. But let's talk about the tax cuts. As I said in one of my earlier remarks, extending the tax cuts is a bipartisan thing. Tax cuts for all Americans and small businesses. The problem is, is that many small businesses are taxed as individuals. And so it's nice that we able, we're able to provide tax breaks for small businesses and every American. The point of fact is, is that I trust the American people to do and to do better with an investment of their money than Washington, D.C. Every dollar that's taken out of your pocket and spent in some bureaucratic black hole in Washington, D.C., is a dollar that's taken out of the economy to expand the economy for either investments or for savings or for sending a kid to college, something as simple as that. Gentlemen, uh, you have both, with great articulation, expressed the two arguments on the sides of this issue. As you know, the lame duck Congress coming back after Election Day may settle this. I say may. I'm an optimist. And the deal being talked about is a compromise, which would be extend the tax cuts for everyone, but for the wealthy people after a period of two, three, or some years, reduce them. Could you go for that, Mr. Heinrich? You know, I, I actually have to um, agree with Alan Greenspan on this one, and he's uh, not somebody I always agree with, but, you know, he said extending the, the tax breaks for people, uh, typically millionaires and billionaires, doesn't do a lot to stimulate our economy. 
It's the people who spend the money back into the local economy uh, who's, uh, who don't invest the extra $100,000 they get because of that, that tax cut, uh, but who really need it and spend it on food and invest it in things that they need in their family's home that make the economy heat up and work again. Uh, I support uh, extending the tax cut for middle class families and letting it expire so that we can pay off $700 billion worth so of the our debt. my question is no, you that's, wouldn't go for that correct. deal. That's Mr. Correct. Brella. Well, it's my turn to <laughs> agree with somebody I typically don't agree with either. <laughs> and that's Peter Orszag, the former OMB director for uh, Mr. Obama. And I would also agree with the 40 or so uh, Democrat colleagues that Mr. Heinrich serves with, who's also suggested to extend the tax cuts for all Americans and for all small businesses. But look, I really think this is a bipartisan thing. As I said before, we need to work in a bipartisan manner to make sure that we do the best we can to turn this economy around, right the ship, and certainly reduce the debt and deficit. Well, if I understand it correctly, Mr. Orzak says, but after two or three years, sure then reduce it for the wealthy. Well, that's something certainly that, that he agrees with and something I might agree with. But the point is, is that the 40 Democratic colleagues say just, right. you know, eliminate them for every. Let's move on to another subject. And uh, Leticia Delgado. Leticia, come up here. You have a very hot subject uh, that she'll introduce for us. Go right ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, what venues, if any, would you provide for illegal immigrants a path to legal residence, and how could the DREAM Act affect undocumented students? John Barella, you have it here. Well, like you, Mr. Donaldson, I grew up very, very close to the border, and this is an issue that uh, means a great deal to me. Um, by way of background at the School of Foreign Service, I studied this issue academically in 1986 when I was working for Mr. Skeen. Um, uh, we dealt with the Immigration Reform and Control Act, otherwise known as Simpson-Mazzoli at that time. Um, have also uh, certainly followed the issue uh, since, since those days. Immigration is a very uh, complex and emotional subject. Uh, I think when we talk about immigration and, and the issues specifically that you raised, Letitia, is that we have to first of all start with the notion that we need border security. Uh, I was briefed three weeks ago on the horrendous violence by the narco-terrorists that occur virtually every day in Ciudad Juarez. The graphic illustrations of that violence should be alarming to every American, especially those who live in New Mexico. I'm saddened by what is happening because I did study in Mexico and it, was a it is a beautiful country with beautiful people. So we need to understand that unlike when I studied the issue back in 1980 and when I traveled throughout every northern Mexican state, the issue of immigration has to be viewed through the prism now of national security, unfortunately, and not necessarily labor. So we need to make sure that every airport, seaport, port of entry, the southern and the northern border are secure. Once we can certify that, then we need to look at a humane and rational and effective guest worker program. Um, I might break ranks for some in my party in saying that I'm not a round them up and throw them out kind of guy. As we speak, there are probably people coming home from working the fields in the 100 degree weather of Yuma, Arizona, or the Central Valley of California, who are indeed contributing to this economy. And I might also point out, to more specifically answer your question, that it's tough when a, and I've been chairman of the APS Foundation and other educational nonprofits, and I've got a soft heart for this, when you get a kid who wants an education in the public schools, it's very difficult to turn that person away. And I, for one, would not want to do that. Mr. Heinrich. Thank you. And it's a great question because for too long it's one that uh, too many in Washington, D.C. have kicked down the road, uh, kicked the can down the road, wouldn't deal with it. Uh, I think the current Congress is guilty of that. I've been an advocate for stepping up and acting now, uh, acting this year, uh, regardless of the fact that there may be political consequences. But it's our job to lead, and uh, that's not always the easy thing, but I think that's the right thing. I think we need a border. Uh, or a immigration policy that is tough, fair, and practical. Uh, when it comes to border enforcement, uh, there has not been a more serious Congress about increasing our border enforcement. Uh, we just funded, completely paid for, uh, a thousand new Border Patrol agents on the border, 250 new customs agents. Um, but we also need to deal with the issue of those who are already here, who are undocumented, who are going to our schools, who are working in our economy. Uh, we need a fair system, one that actually uh, 
to return to enforcement for a minute, we also need to enforce on employers because there are some employers who knowingly uh, hire undocumented workers hoping to avoid things like the minimum wage, hoping to avoid things like payroll taxes. Uh, when those taxes aren't paid, that takes money and puts it into a black market economy. Services go out, but uh, the, the, uh, the income to pay for those services disappears. Um, that's not fair to the American taxpayer and we need to fix that. Finally, we do need a practical solution. Uh, one that takes the people who are already here and separates them into one group, uh, puts everybody through a uh, Department of Homeland Security background check, and one group that if they're involved in narco trafficking or any other uh, illegal activity, they get deported. If their only crime is their immigration status, and they're willing to learn English, and they're willing to jump through the hoops of, of really saying, I want to be a part of this economy, and I'm willing to become not an undocumented worker, but a taxpayer, then they get into the immigration system. Not citizenship, but at the end of the line in the immigration system. It's not feasible to throw a net around 12 million people and deport them all overnight. So I think we need to do uh, all of the above, tough, fair, and practical. The people who prepared that question in that group also wanted to know about the DREAM Act and your position on the DREAM Act, which would say that young children brought to this country by people who are illegal who have crossed the border, however, would have a better chance to have a path towards citizenship. Well, I, I, I may have answered the question uh, in, in my earlier answer. Again, I do not believe in turning down any individual in this country, a young person who is seeking an education, as long as they came here uh, seeking to contribute to this economy and they can be good, uh, productive citizens uh, of, this, of this country. And also, would you I might add, uh, would I vote for the DREAM Act? I, not in its current form because uh, there are some issues that I have with it and because it's not consistent with what I would pursue in terms of true immigration reform. Uh, do I believe in the concept and the general parameters of the DREAM Act? I just got in telling an Albuquerque Interfaith Group the other day, you bet. Uh, I, I would vote for the DREAM Act. I'm a co-sponsor of the DREAM Act. I think if uh, an individual is willing to um, you know, to pick up a rifle and defend this country in the military or go to college and get an engineering degree or become a doctor, um, that those are the people that we, we should be welcoming into our immigration system. I might just add one, one final thing. There may be one issue that, that Mr. Heinrich and I agree on, and that is indeed the people who, uh, who do enter into our armed forces. There are thousands of people who are, don't have their immigration status normalized, who are serving proudly for our country, and I do believe that those individuals who are honorably discharged deserve uh, citizenship since they have defended this country and fought for our country. I have no okay, problem Woody with that. Okay, Woody Weed, uh, an engineer here in Albuquerque, changing the subject. Another good one? Go right ahead. Given the number of uh, baby boomers that will retire in the next 20 years, how do we make Social Security how do we make sure that Social Security can meet its obligations, both in that time period and uh, in perpetuity? Mark behind me. Well, first, I want to say that I think Social Security is one of those issues where, um, while we've heard um, would-be Speaker Boehner step up and say we need to raise the retirement age, and, and people like uh, uh, Eric Cantor and um, Paul Ryan uh, in the Republican leadership say we need to, to privatize uh, Social Security. I think we're getting way ahead of ourselves in terms of what the problem is. We have real issues right now that we can fix in terms of our financial solvency. Social Security is at least solvent through 2037. So I, I don't think we should extend the Bush tax cuts and then say, well, we've got um, to pay for this hole. We're going to take it out of Social Security. People pay into that their entire lives. The biggest thing we could do to increase Social Security solvency right now is to recover the economy so that people are paying the payroll taxes that they need to be right now to get, uh, uh, to get Social Security back on track. John Barilla. Well, unlike the allegations made uh, in Mr. Heinrich's commercials and frankly the mis- uh, I'm going to call them frankly distortions of the truth, Mr. Heinrich, I have never been on the record of stating that I would privatize Social Security, nor have I ever said that I would raise the retirement age so your ads, and I would challenge you to bring them down because they are indeed uh, factually incorrect. Uh, they're wrong and they're very misleading to the voters of this district and of New Mexico. But when we talk about Social Security, um, look, 
I have parents who are in Social Security and they might be watching from Las Cruces. So uh, they also uh, help uh, supplement their income with Social Security. So let me be very clear and on the record once again, I do not favor privatization of Social Security nor raising the retirement age. So that being said, uh, I do believe uh, that uh, we need to continue to focus on, on, uh, on bringing uh, entitlements into line in the long term with spending priorities. Uh, what we've done uh, is that we've threatened Social Security by expanding, once again, another entitlement program, and that's, uh, that's the health care bill. Um, and when you talk about hurting seniors, this health care bill guts Medicare by a half a trillion dollars. Uh, that hurts uh, seniors, uh, 74,000 or so who rely on Medicare Advantage. So when you expand other entitlement programs, you inherently mean that to uh, certainly be fiscally accountable, you start taking away from people who have paid in or potentially uh, uh, ha uh, uh, taken away from people who have put uh, paid in all their lives to Social Security. And that's the problem when you expand entitlement program after entitlement program, like Mr. Heinrich and Ms. Pelosi have done. Mm -hmm. Mr. Heinrich. Uh, well, first off, I have to say a vote for this Republican leadership, uh, a vote for John Boehner to be the speaker, uh, for Paul Ryan to be in charge of the Budget Committee, that is a vote to dismantle Social Security. I mean, Paul Ryan and Eric Cantor have written the book on privatization. Uh, we all know what John Boehner said just a couple of months ago. Um, I think that uh, the fact that my opponent wouldn't take future privatization off the table in his interview with the journal uh, says that, as he said many times, everything's on the table. For me, not everything's on the table. Uh, privatization is not on the table. Certainly raising the retirement age beyond what it's already been raised is not on the table. Well, what is on the table? I mean, the question, I'm, I'm just trying to repeat the question, what specifically would you do when there, at some point the fund runs out because there are too many people my age on it and not enough people your age working, well, what would you do? I think it's a bit of a red herring to say we might have a problem in 2037 when we have a huge hole in the budget right now. And the best thing we can do to make sure that we can deal with Social Security decades from now is to uh, plug a $700 billion hole in, uh, in our budget right now by letting the Bush tax. So nothing, Mr. Varela, what would you do specifically about this? You said you're, you're not for this, you're not for that. What well, first, you, Mr. Donaldson, there's only, you know, he says speculatively that, that uh, a vote for Boehner is a vote for privatization, et cetera, et cetera. Mr. Heinrich, there's only one candidate in this campaign who's voted to hurt seniors, and that was a $500 billion cut to Medicare under the health care bill. But if you're talking about a hole in the budget, the hole in the budget was blown wide open by the $3 trillion worth of new deficits that were added to this debt that we currently have, $13.3 trillion. That's how you blew the, the hole in the budget, Mr. Heinrich, you and your votes. Your votes for health care add another $1.3 trillion over 10 years to, to the budget deficit and debt. Uh, not to mention the fact that uh, your jobs killing votes also hurt the revenue that would come into uh, Washington. Mr. No, Heinrich, go right ahead, and they're telling off, me that you're it, 90 seconds when it, when l it, l less than the, Mr. Barella. So take your time, sir. Thank you. <laughs> when it comes to uh, uh, this whole issue of Medicare, there is a difference between Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Uh, Medicare Advantage was taking money out of the, uh, the public system and, and putting it straight into the pockets of corporations for their profits. It was a subsidy that couldn't be sustained. And by closing the loopholes in Medicare Advantage, we extended the solvency of Medicare out to 14 years. Um, Medicare itself was under threat because of Medicare Advantage. And we stood up for our seniors who were on Medicare, seniors like my parents. Um, I, I think it's absolutely ridiculous that my opponent's ads don't say we cut back on Medicare Advantage. They say we cut back on Medicare. That is completely false. So uh, there's a little bit of the pot calling the kettle black here. While we're on this subject, Terry Chang, please come up and ask your question. Terry is a medical student at the University of New Mexico. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, do you believe the individual mandate violates the Constitution? Why or why not? And I've forgotten who has it first. Does anyone remember? If not, go I, I ahead. Think I do. Mr. Barella. Yeah, right. I think I do. Uh, I think it certainly might. Uh, I think it certainly does. Uh, you know, regardless of the constitutionality of this, for Congress to come in and actually mandate uh, 
people to purchase health care insurance to me is once again another piece of evidence of the intrusion of government into our personal lives. Uh, regardless of the constitutionality of it, to me it's philosophically wrong. You know, it's time for people to, to take ownership over their own lives. And, and this nanny state, this governmental imposition on virtually every aspect of our life is where Mr. Heinrich and I philosophically disagree. He believes that the government should come in and mandate these types of things on the individual, on on families, and on small business. I think it's the wrong approach. You know, I think Americans can make decisions for themselves about how to go about spending on their health care. Martin Heinrich, and both of you, you know that the courts so far are allowing suits by at least 20 attorneys general to go forward on this very issue. So what is your view? Uh, my view is that if um, if you look at the model for the health care reform legislation, it was really Massachusetts. It was Republican Mitt Romney's bill through the Massachusetts legislature, working with Democrats on the other side to try and deal with the incredible uninsured program or problem that led to the kind of reform that we saw in Washington. I'm not a constitutional scholar, but certainly that legislation has stood the test of time uh, and the court test. The reason why I voted for health care reform is because our health care system was broken. I mean, we had a system where insurance companies were making decisions, not doctors. Insurance companies were in between the doctors and their patients. This isn't about government getting in between. It's about putting control back in the hands of our providers, our health care professionals. We had insurance companies taking money for years from some people. And when they got sick, they called it a rescission. They kicked them off their coverage. That was wrong, and we put an end to it. It was morally wrong. That's why I voted for health care reform. When it comes to things like uh, pre-existing conditions, I had a dad talk to me about his daughter who had grown up with epilepsy. And when she was getting ready to go off of, off of his insurance plan, not a single insurance company would take her. What was she supposed to do? When people fall into those kinds of positions, oftentimes what they do is they go to the county hospital and we pay it through our taxes instead of paying it through health insurance. Um, so I'm proud that we closed the donut hole in Medicare Part D, especially given the previous administration not even bothering to finance the program. I'm glad we stood up to insurance companies and it's about putting control back in the hands of doctors and their patients. Rana? Well, if you wanted to fix the donut hole uh, issue, you didn't need 2,700 pages and a twisted, distorted legislative process to do so, Mr. Heinrich. But I'm going to go back to agreeing with, uh, again, an unlikely person. I agree with Speaker Pelosi when she said in order to understand what's in the bill, you got to pass it. Fact of the matter is you have 2,700 pages of legislation that members of Congress had basically 72 hours to peruse. If anybody tells you they read the bill in its entirety, be very suspicious. If anybody tells you they read it and understand it, they're flat out lying to you. But here's the, here's the issue with the health care bill. It's, again, a trail of promises made and promises broken. They promised an open and transparent government, Ms. Pelosi and Mr. Heinrich. And yet, even if you can defend the substance of this bill, it's very, very difficult for anybody to look at the people with a straight face and say, I can defend the process of which this bill was passed. They promised that it would only cost $940 billion over 10 years. Guess what? CBO came out and others came out and said it's going to cost well over a trillion dollars over 10 years. They also promised that virtually every American would be covered under this piece of legislation and now we find out that maybe 19 to 23 million Americans are not going to be covered. They promised they wouldn't gut Medicare, but Mr. Heinrich just uh, conceded the point that Medicare Advantage would be cut under this program. So the 74,000 uh, New Mexicans that are covered by Medicare Advantage are going to have to answer for this promises made and promises broken. Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Borrella started this round, sure. so you have the last word, and then we'll move on. Well, there's, first off, you have to understand there was a difference between the, uh, the copy of the legislation that I carried around uh, for a number of months when we were having all of our uh, meetings and town halls last summer when 1,500 people joined me just down the road to talk about the merits of the legislation and my opponent's copy. Uh, my, cop my copy actually was dog-eared. It had notes. My opponent's copy was in cellophane. Uh, how many times has he held it up and it was still in the wrapper? That's certainly not how you understand the legislation. Uh, it took seven months to negotiate the compromise that was health care reform. Is it all perfect? No. 
we should go back and fix those things that don't work. But I'm not going to go back to the days before health care reform when there was a donut hole in the Medicare Part D program. And senior after senior would come up to me and say, you know, in June I fall off coverage and I have to make decisions about do I pay for uh, my prescription drugs or do I pay the rent or do I pay for food. Um, they have to make tough choices. We fixed that. Insurance companies were kicking people off the rolls after they got sick. We fixed that. People who have diabetes and heart conditions and epilepsy can get coverage today in the private market. Um, that, that is something to be proud of. I think we should keep what works uh, and revisit what doesn't. And uh, I certainly wouldn't put the insurance companies back in charge. We have two big issues of great interest to in New Mexicans, energy and education. Let's get to them both and beginning with uh, uh, Eduardo Perez Boucher. Come right up here, sir, in the insurance business. And yours is energy, isn't it? Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity for being here. Uh, should the government intervene in the regulation of the energy market to regulate carbon? Why or why not? And I know it goes to you, Martin Heinrich. Well, first off, I think we have to recognize that um, I I'm one, at least, that believes in science. And I grew up uh, getting an engineering degree. Uh, I believe we have to make policy that's educated by science. Uh, and the science is pretty clear on this. We've got a carbon problem. Uh, the way to solve it, uh, I thought, was to take a, a book out of the page of the Heritage Foundation, one of those conservative foundations that came up with a, a little idea a number of year, years ago um, that they called cap and trade, and they applied it to sulfur dioxide uh, in the uh, eastern states. As a result, uh, some people said, oh, the cost of regulating this in the trading market, it's going to jack up the price of, uh, of um, uh, producing energy. What it did was create jobs. And the clean energy bill that we passed in Congress had more potential to create jobs in New Mexico than any other thing that we did in this entire Congress. The renewable portfolio standard expanded to the entire country. Uh, remember when New Mexico stepped up? and put a renewable portfolio standard in place so that we would be a leader creating solar jobs, creating wind jobs, creating energy jobs ahead of the curve, we had the opportunity to dramatically expand those jobs here in Albuquerque. And I can tell you, you know, I have a, a neighbor down the street who was in the real estate business until uh, the, uh, the, the subprime market hit, uh, the consequences of that happened. He started a solar company. He's hiring right now because of what we've done to lead on clean energy. We're going to create those jobs somewhere. They're either going to be created in China and India and Denmark and Spain and countries that lead on clean energy, or they're going to, they're going to happen here. I'm going to make sure they happen in New Mexico and in the United States. John Barella, should the government intervene in the energy market to regulate carbon? <laughs> well, the short answer is no. Here's the interesting thing. I guess it's the night of agreeing with uh, unlikely uh, political opponents. You know, Greenpeace, of all people, called this cap-and-trade Waxman-Markey bill political hypocrisy. And I agree with them. This Waxman-Markey bill that Mr. Heinrich voted for and was supported is nothing more than a complex scheme that creates a new government entity, new uh, government agencies, places uh, artificial limits on manufacturers and other job creators. It's a job-killing bill. It's an energy tax. Don't let them hide behind euphemisms like cap and trade and clean energy and all of that. In fact, it's a job killer. The last thing we need right now is a bill like this, which will impose a new uh, set of regulations upon, upon businesses. And you know, I'm happy that there are people that are, that are getting jobs in the solar industry. I think those things uh, in, in the clean, in, in, in clean uh, uh, energy industry, those things uh, will have happened anyway, in my opinion. But to come in and create winners and losers in the energy industry is to me is a mistake. Uh, as it is right now, we're having a hard time in the manufacturing sector to create jobs in this economy. This bill puts not only one arm, but two arms behind the back of U.S. manufacturers. And even if you do believe that this bill is the right approach, it's not going to affect global warming one bit. Most people say it's not going to uh, affect it at all for a number of reasons. Why? Because our competitor nations like China, Indonesia, Brazil, and others have said, have said thanks, but no thanks to this bill. We've basically unilaterally disarmed when it comes to creating jobs in this country thanks to these kinds of job killing votes. So I, I would disagree with things like cap and trade. It's a scheme that doesn't work. 
Dr. Heinrich? You know, I believe in the jobs of the future, not just the jobs of the past, but we can learn from the past. This country used to make things. It used to manufacture things. And because of trade policies where we, uh, we basically tied our hands behind our back, where we uh, allowed ourselves to be on an unlevel playing field, and because we refuse to lead on the very things that we have the most opportunity to lead in. That's why we're not growing jobs faster in this country. New Mexico has the second highest solar potential uh, in the 50 states. Germany produces more solar than any country in the world right now, and they have the solar exposure of Alaska. Think what we can do in New Mexico to create jobs. Not just to make those solar panels, to install those solar panels, those are the good jobs of the future that are going to mean that my kids can grow up right here in Albuquerque and inherit a brighter, cleaner future. I'm not going to invest in the dirty technologies of 100 years ago. I'm going to invest in the future. And when I talk to venture capitalists, when I talk to some of the big, uh, the big companies that look long term at these issues, even the utilities, they all say, what we need is certainty and then we'll innovate because this is America and innovation is what we do best. And as a result, that's how we create jobs. Mr. Borello, you'll get to answer this next question first. It's a companion question to what we've been talking about. And Cheryl Haker, you have it. Cheryl Haker is an Albuquerque small business owner. Come right up here and ask the question. Thank you. This is another one from the Energy Policy Group, of which I was a member. What is your strategy to implement smart grid technology for electrical transmission? Mr. Borello. Well, uh, we certainly need to look at, uh, at meeting the challenges of, of electricity generation as we, as we move forward. I believe that the federal government and uh, certainly the private public sector have a big role to play in this sort of uh, initiative, and it's something I would certainly support. Uh, you know, Mr. Heinrich mentioned certainty uh, when we create energy policy. Right now we've created uncertainty in, in energy creation in this country, and I lament that. Uh, the fact of the matter is we need uh, certainty uh, in not only the economy, but certainty when it comes to this sort of issue, uh, especially when it relates to um, uh, this, this matter. Uh, there are a whole lot of, of, of possibilities and potential. Uh, I think that Sandia National Labs, for example, an expansion of their mission uh, to do this type of research is a golden opportunity uh, for us to experience here in this state. That also create jobs and stabilize its mission as well. So those are the kinds of things that I would support as well. Mr. Heinrich, Smart Grid? Well, for starters, Sandia National Labs is already doing this. Uh, they are working on uh, analyses right now about how to implement Smart Grid technology. And I introduced legislation just a few months ago in the Armed Services Committee to do a demonstration project at one of our military sites uh, because there are no sites that are, are, are more primed for implementing smart grid technology, uh, distributed generation, and learning from those than our uh, military installations. Oftentimes, they are stuck on the grid. Uh, they are subject to the power outages that can happen from unreliable transmission, uh, as well as potential terrorist threats. Uh, it's a great place to start to really begin to implement uh, microgrid technology, smart grid technology, and to learn from it. And when we do that, and in fact the Recovery Act that my opponent lamented, um, invested more in smart grid technology than any legislation that we've seen in the last 20 years. And as a result, it's taking off and it's being applied by utilities around the, uh, around the country, and it's benefiting local employers. People like Thomas and Betts, a manufacturer on the west side that I visited just a couple of months ago. They're actually adding jobs in the midst of this recession, expanding their manufacturing lines, and one of the places they found a real niche is making high quality smart grid um, uh, instrumentation equipment so that utilities can employ a future microgrid, smart grid technology. Gentlemen, time is fleeting. Let's move to education. Alexander Navarro, you have the question. Alexander is a student and also in the military? Uh, I may. Oh, fine. Um, how will you attract businesses to New Mexico in order to compete in the global economy when we rank so low in education here in New Mexico? Mr. Heinrich, you, you're first up. Well, one, I think we need to take advantage of the places that we do well and to grow those. Um, I'm, as I mentioned, an engineer by background, and one of the reasons why I'm here in Albuquerque is because of our strengths. 
places like Air Force Research Labs and the work they do on directed energy, places like Sandia National Labs. Um, I worked for a contractor at, at Air Force Research Labs on directed energy, and it helped me realize that, that we can um, grow the economy here with smart investment and smart technologies. Uh, by uh, investing in the potential of directed energy in my tenure in the Congress, we set the stage to not only recover a program in the airborne laser test bed that was on basically death row, we also attracted private business to New Mexico like Boeing that just recently relocated their directed energy headquarters to Albuquerque, bringing 100 uh, jobs with them. We need to redo No Child Left Behind and begin investing in STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math at an elementary school level to be able to continue to grow that high-tech strength that we have in central New Mexico. We're not doing that because No Child Left Behind said to our teachers, you're gonna be, uh, you're gonna be tested, 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 and we're not gonna test on science in elementary school. So do you think most elementary schools that are struggling, uh, that wanna get higher test scores are gonna bother with science? Too many of them don't. We need to make sure that science is back in the classroom at the elementary school level, and then we need to, to revamp our Elementary and Secondary Education Act in a way that recognizes growth that says to a fifth grade teacher who has a child come in, in the second, with a second grade reading level, that if they can move them to a fourth grade reading level in one year, that's not failing, that's succeeding. That kind of growth model allows us to look at schools that are taking the toughest kids uh, that are doing a good job and moving them multiple years forward in their education and recognizing the work that they've done and investing in that. Mr. Brella. We need a seamless workforce development system in this state and in this country. Um, other industrialized countries like Ireland have done an amazing job uh, and certainly worth studying. Uh, I too don't support No Child Left Behind. I think it had problems. Uh, philosophically, I think it's an example of where Washington comes in and lays its heavy hand upon local districts. I think school districts uh, should primarily, local control of school districts is really where I am philosophically with this issue. Again, we don't need Washington coming in and telling us how we should be running our schools here at APS or in Los Lunas or Belen or parts of Rio Rancho, et cetera. Uh, let me say this. Uh, part of the workforce development system that I have contemplated is the result of many years of being active in uh, educational nonprofits, leading the Hispano Chamber, workforce development groups. I was chairman of the workforce development board. If we can target certain industries either in the state, for example, semiconductor manufacturing, work with local school districts, local uh, community colleges and universities like we have been doing, and then target those jobs and some of the resources to come through uh, those educational systems, work with uh, community-based organizations to identify promising students, and then harness the resources in math, science, and technology. It's a locally-based, ground-up approach toward creating this type of workforce development system that has, has really shown some promise here. But let me just finish by saying this. The notion that we throw more money at education is the wrong notion. Uh, the fact is that we continue to throw money at education, both at the federal level uh, primarily and at the state level uh, sometimes. And the problem is, is that we're creating the same thing, and that is high, high uh, dropout rates, low graduation rates, and it doesn't work. The billions of dollars we're spending on education, both at the state and federal level, uh, as it affects New Mexico, will never replace the hours of a responsible parent to spend with their kid. And we need to figure out ways to encourage parents uh, to be involved in this educational General, process. We only have a couple of minutes left. Bring up a subject, each of you, that you want to talk about. Maybe we covered it or maybe we didn't. Mr. You know, Morello, you start. Go ahead. Go well, I, I think there's an issue of ethics uh, that, that we certainly can talk about. Um, and I think that uh, those who know me know that I have spent a good deal of my time and professional time working for, uh, and as an assistant attorney general, working for transparency in government. To me, that's an issue that I have a record on, and it's something that I feel strongly about. Uh, when I was an assistant attorney general and director of the civil division, I found it very, very important to do government in the open. Government in the sunshine of, often really uh, uh, leads to good results. Uh, an educated democracy is certainly needed. 
Uh, I lament the fact that in Washington, D.C., and I come back to the health care bill, that there was no uh, uh, transparency in government. And I lament the fact that, my hein uh, that Mr. Heinrich uh, refused to uh, vote for investigations of pay-to-play type You've schemes. You've got to give Mr. Heinrich, before sure. we get cut off by the cruel clock, his minute. Go ahead, sir. Well, here's what I'll tell you is unethical about politics today and, unfortunately, the, uh, the way congressional races are done. You know, when Citizens United decision came down from the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court basically said that corporations, um, that citizens, individual citizens like all of you, uh, can, only, can only be, uh, be involved a little bit in politics, but corporations can spend as much as they want. That's unethical. And we've seen the direct results of that. We've seen the fact that you can, uh, if you give to my opponent or me, you have to you know, your name is going to show up on a list. There's transparency. But if you give to one of these shadowy 527 groups, these swift boat groups, you can give a million dollars and never have to have your name end up on the Gentlemen, television on that, screen. On that, that, okay, go ahead, Sam. the last word, I'm sorry. Because we've run out of time for this important discussion in the race for New Mexico's first congressional district. I want to thank the candidates. I want to thank the people who developed the questions for the candidates. It's been a spirited, but as I said in the last debate, it's been a civil debate, and we thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. We'll be back next Wednesday with the debate in the congressional district, which is the uh, second congressional district in Las Cruces. I hope you'll join us then at 7 o'clock. I'm Sam Donaldson. Thank you for joining us tonight, and be sure and vote.